testing and troubleshooting vibration shutdown alarms presented by the modal shop again my name is Mike Scott and I have done trainings at power plants and refineries all over the world and the number one topic by far is always proximity probes so we're going to dive right into real life proximity probe troubleshooting situations so if that is of interest to you please stick around and we will get uh, right into the, the meat of troubleshooting proximity probes, cable length, gap voltage, all that good stuff. Um, long thought of as a test and measurement company, the modal shop uh, primary tie to the industrial and energy market is that we manufacture the world's most popular portable vibration calibrator or portable shaker table and that's going to feature heavily in this presentation but it won't be a sales pitch by any means as a little bit of a sales pitch it's hard not to but uh, mostly we're going to focus on the technical today the reasons why the vibration uh, protection system might uh, might fail um, but the portable shaker table is required by API 670 and we have a variety of versions of the product that's manufactured here in our A2LA accredited vibration calibration lab in Cincinnati, Ohio. We're mostly known for uh, rental and recalibration services. There's a lot of products that you can rent through our company. Um, and we're of course known for our uh, uh, laboratory metrology calibration systems, pressure sensors, accelerometers, uh, microphones, things like that. Uh, the modal shop is part of PCB Pizzatronics, sort of, in a way. Uh, you, without being too confusing, we're like the calibration division of PCB Pizzatronics. So uh, PCB, I used to work there, spent 10 years working there. Uh, I used to park uh, right between the two buildings right there. Oh, did that not work? It's trying to highlight. Uh, laser pointer. No one cares where I park my car by now, so that joke didn't land, but it used to be right in this general area here. Uh, this is the sensor manufacturing building, and this is the machine shop that they built after I started working there. They, the machine shop used to be in here, and to give you an idea, um, our sensor business just really took off to the point where they had to run a full-blown three shifts machine shop right here. They're always, there's always a sign here um, to say that we're hiring, I mean, we can't hire fast enough for the machine shop, and it takes up this entire building right here. So, um, the thing about PCB is we made stuff that's hard to make. Um, I used to work with a guy named John Pendrick, who it was him and like one other guy who could make these sensors for a specific vibration OEM that had to work to 10 kilohertz, and it was very much skilled labor. He would work under a microscope build the sensor as a triaxial accelerometer for the industrial market made specifically for an OEM and it was hard to make because it was heavy and it had to be perfect. It was heavy and it had to work to 10 kilohertz which are two things that work um, in the opposite direction. It's really hard to do that. So uh, PCB makes a lot of uh, is, is skilled labor and they make um, terrific sensors for the test and measurement market and uh, aerospace and industrial as well. So um, it's a, a really cool place to work. Worst coffee on the planet. All right, here is me. This is about as serious as I can possibly look. And I've spent 16 years in this industry. Uh, I currently worked at the modal shop in Cincinnati, Ohio, 10 years previously in Buffalo, New York. So I got, I got out of the snow. And uh, I don't know, you can see some credentials there, but I am the least athletic person to ever be featured on ESPN Sports Center as the number one play. And it wasn't a blooper either. You would think it was a blooper, right? I mean, look at me, it's gonna be a blooper, but it wasn't. So um, that is my claim to fame, but my 15 minutes of fame are indeed over and I have to just kind of work like a regular job now. So that's kind of how it goes. So as a company, we do understand uh, power generation. We have a variety of solutions for the market. We offer expertise in uh, ground fault monitoring on uh, generators, uh, especially brushless generators, um, where a current arc, straight current arc can lead to damage of the generator. We have a system to make sure that does not happen, that the generator is correctly grounded. Uh, we'll talk about proximity probe troubleshooting today. 
Uh, combustion dynamics is another field of expertise, measuring the pressure in the combustion chamber of a gas turbine uh, to run leaner to, for, for NOx emissions. Um, noise exposure measurements, actually our next webinar, just to name a few. Uh, many of these topics uh, are covered in future webinars, of course, so please sign up for our uh, other webinars if you're interested. One of the final slides of this presentation is our webinar schedule. And uh, next week I'll be discussing uh, troubleshooting. Um, I'm sorry. Next week we'll be discussing the noise monitoring webinar, actually. But uh, uh, just one second here before I go to the next slide. All right. So we will move on. There we go. I, once I start this laser pointer, I can't stop it. Um, how can we test vibration alarms? Well, we have a portable vibration shaker table for that. And uh, let me turn off this uh, laser pointer. Sorry. In order to play the video, I need to turn off the laser pointer. And here we go. Just getting used to it. So we do have this portable vibration shaker table that provides mechanical excitation to the transducer. Um, sim there's two ways to test vibration sensors, simulation and uh, mechanical excitation. Now, simulation only tests the electronics, uh, not the sensor on the machine. Like it's, it's like having your car inspected without checking the tires. The only part that touches the road is the tires. The only part that of a vibration monitoring system that touches the machine is the sensor. Um, and that's why the API 670 standard requires field testing with a variable frequency uh, portable shaker table. Um, with mechanical excitation, you can test the entire system in the scales that you see here on the screen and either one of the speeds that you see on the screen. And, and that's pretty consistent throughout any shaker table. It doesn't even have to be ours. Uh, moving on. <clears throat> so the portable vibration shaker table, like I said, provides excitation to the transducer. And in this video, you're going to see me just kind of change the amplitude here, um, which is right under the, the pointer, and then also change the scales by using the amplitude dial. And of course, the frequency dial will change the speed of the vibration. And this allows you to compare known versus measured. Uh, I once went to a seminar on pressure sensor calibration, and the guy giving the seminar asked, uh, you know, why, you know, the number one reason to calibrate a pressure sensor, I mean, he was a big fan of doing a full-blown full loop check. Instead of just connecting the transmitter from the pressure sensor to the calibrator, he was a fan of actually um, providing its own pressure to the pressure sensor and making sure that the DCS or PLC measured that specific pressure. And that's what we're doing here. That's what we recommend as a very first step here. Drive the sensor whether it's a prox probe or a case mounted vibration sensor to the alert and alarm level at the running speed of the machine. And, and that's a good recommendation because it's kind of the, the first thing is uh, people ask me, what speed should I use? Well, uh, these proximity probes and case mounted vibration sensors are most sensitive to vibration at machine running speed. So that's where I would start. Uh, a lot of uh, machinery faults happen at running speed or two times running speed. And if you want, you can get into other frequencies of interest and speed, but, but one times running speed is a great place to start. Can't go wrong with um, using that speed. And then of course you have to wait out the time delays, which I'll, I'll show in a video uh, later in the presentation and ensure that the, the shutdown logic works. So that's the best way to test the vibration alarm is to loop check through mechanical excitation, starting with the sensor that's mounted on the machine, checking the cable connected to the sensor, then um, the power supply or proximeter, the cable coming out of that supply to the control room or to the monitoring system, all the way to the point where you're checking to make sure that you got a text message to your cell phone that the vibration level was too high. And of course, checking the time delays as well. And this is a good example of a full-blown loop check. Um, in this case, this is courtesy of Indonesia Power. And in this, the uh, technicians first mount the proximity probe to the portable shaker table, and they use this uh, DMM to set their gap voltage, of course. They can perform a static calibration, 
Um, but the uh, fun part is actually driving, and you'll you'll see this later in the presentation. These pictures aren't super close up on the shaker, but the fun part is actually driving that proximity probe to the alert and alarm values. So in the the alert was at 160 microns. In this case, they were getting 163. A technician radios to the control room. I believe this is a Shinkawa system. Radios to the control room to make sure that the alert has tripped and they're reading the right value. Pretty close. And then uh, they were a little high. Uh, they were shaking at 250 microns, reading 277. But they indeed got the second alarm to trip as well. So that's a, an example of a full-blown lube check for the purpose of uh, troubleshooting a proximity probe vibration monitoring system. So as you will see on the next couple slides, mounting breaks into two separate topics, proximity probes and everything else. If you can mount, you have the ball in the red zone for alarm testing, so to speak. You're 80% of the way there. Sometimes when customers want to separate instrumentation from the monitoring system for troubleshooting, then we need to worry about power, which is like the other 10% of my job. Uh, and you're thinking, well, that only adds up to 90%. Well, the final 10% is running my fantasy football league. So, you know, that's a, a big chunk of it. Actually, let me walk that back. It's 50% fantasy football, 50, no, I'm just kidding. But if you can mount, um, you are 80% of the way there. And um, the most diffi difficult thing to mount is proximity probes. And then the case mounted transducers are rather simple to mount. But once you get the hang of it, everything is fairly simple to mount, as you'll see on the next slide. So how to mount proximity probes. Proximity probes are different because instead of mounting a sensor to the shaker and driving it, you are simulating shaft motion by mechanically driving a 4140 steel target, then pointing the probe at the target. Chemical composition of 4140 steel is 42 CRMO4, if you ever see that on the data sheet as well. Some uh, proximity probe vendors say 42 CRMO4, some say 4140 steel on their calcerts. They are the same thing. Um, so this is the target mounted on the shaker. And uh, uh, the idea is to drive that target to simulate uh, shaft movement. Uh, by the nature of our design, um, does allow us to offer custom target materials. If you happen to be using, uh, the, the system I know best is Bentley Nevada. It's not the only system out there. There's ePro, there's Metrics. Um, there's some other ones, Shinkawa I mentioned. Um, but if you have Bentley and the proximeter says mod on it, um, then it, it was likely, I believe, calibrated to a custom target material, um, which is kind of fun because the nature of it, there's not any of those um, in, it's, it's like 5% of the applications, I would say, but our shaker design does allow for uh, custom targets to be made, so um, that's always available through, through the modal shop. Um, so we have mounting brackets for 5, 8, 11, and 16 millimeter series probes, which are the most popular for vibration, not the most popular for thrust, but the most popular for vibration. And uh, we also have um, proximity probe mount that's uh, kind of large here, and that is for reverse mounted uh, proximity probes that are installed inside the end of a long housing or stinger. That's, that's actually a really cool uh, proximity probe mounting piece. Um, so if you have any of those probes, we can handle that as well. And of course, these uh, supplied micrometers um, make uh, adjusting the gap voltage quite easy, uh, as opposed to using the threads on the probe itself. It'd be surprised, well, probably not be surprised how little, uh, um, how just a quarter turn changes the gap voltage by like two volts. So the, the, uh, uh, the uh, micrometers are, are great for fine adjustment. How to mount everything else. So that's how you mount proximity probes. Everything else is comparatively easy. You just screw it or bolt it onto the shaker table. Um, if you already own a shaker, which a lot of you do, the most important accessory is this wrench right here. So the wrench secures the shaker's armature when you're tightening these sensors. Now, the shaker's armature is pretty robust. But it wasn't built to survive like a 50 inch pound torque. 
which is what's required on some of these really big sensors, I mean, it'll survive it. It wasn't built necessarily to withstand it. So, um, but it won't break, it'll just loosen. So it's not that fragile, but the torque specified on some of these sensors is really high. So it's best to secure the armature with the supplied mounting wrench. Uh, one thing I wanted to point out on this slide is the uh, Bentley Nevada or any, any type of uh, moving coil seismic probe. This happens to be a Bentley Nevada 9200. Um, when those are made, they are specified uh, there's, there's actually a you can kind of see it here there's a lot of degrees that you can use but the two most popular are horizontal and vertical and if you have the horizontal version when they make it they don't have to compensate for the force of gravity so you can't just put a horizontal version on a vertical shaker and shake it in the vertical axis and have it subjected to the force of gravity you do have to flip it on its side now these are pretty heavy sensors so you can tip the shaker on its side. You just want to be pretty gentle with it. Um, that's a lot of mass hanging off of the sensor. I like to tip it first, then install the sensor, and even put something under the sensor, or even just use my hand, to support it and make sure that it's not weighing down too much on the shaker itself. But that's the, the one caveat here with uh, the case-mounted stuff. Um, most of it can be screwed on or bolted onto the shaker. Pay attention to the seismoprobe uh, orientation uh, to make sure that you're calibrating in the right axis. Okay. Oh, and these are the supplied accessories of the portable shaker. I, I guess this is a little this is a little salesy, uh, but just to show you what what comes with it: uh, metric in English, quarter twenty eight, ten thirty two, M eight by one point two five, M eight by one. These multi-hole mounting pads here cover the six most popular bolt, bolted style sensors, if you will. Find those on gas turbines all the time. Um, we have, we have, uh, I would say, 98% of the sensors that are on the market will be installed using one of these two pads. And you get a charger, you get a USB loaded up with uh, a port generation workbook, CalRAL programming, and all that stuff. I don't really want to go into a big sales pitch here, but I wanted to show the, the mounting on the supplied accessories for the shaker table. Now, this is more fun. This is uh, the verification of uh, vibration alarm. So this is a loop check in general um, using a rather uh, simple device that we have called a vibe alarm. Um, so what I'm going to show here is, uh, is the, the kind of the simple concept of it. We're going to drive this sensor on the shaker to a half inch per second peak and then to one inch per second peak uh, past past a half inch per second and past one inch per second and watch the alert and alarm trigger. Now we've got to wait out the time delays. I programmed a three second time delay. So when you see this value on the vibe alarm cross over a half inch per second, we need to wait three seconds and then you'll see the alert go. So uh, we'll get started here. So you change the amplitude on the portable shaker table just by turning the dial and you can see that this this value is a little bit ahead of this one now we cross it so it's a three two one and then it, it triggers here on the alert and then we're going to go to one inch per second and again the actual vibration is what's displayed on the screen that's going to be a little bit ahead of the monitoring system once the monitoring system catches up it's three two one boom i didn't rehearse that amazing and the alarm triggers of course so that's the basic concept of a loop check we're going to drive a known amplitude here and make sure that our displayed amplitude is relatively close and make sure that the alerts and the alarms trigger that's about all there is to it so proximity probes 101 proximity probe is a three-part system and two parts are pretty boring you have the uh, probe and cable uh, which is nothing more than a coil of wire. The exciting part is the proximeter. Never mind these black pieces. That's just something that comes in our demo kit. You got the probe, extension cable, and the proximeter. And the proximeter is the exciting part because system impedance will change as the rotating shaft moves closer and further from the tip of the probe. It's it's pretty neat. It's an amazing system. Um, 
the impedance is not linear. Um, so the proximeter's job is to linearize that input and turn it into a usable voltage output. To do that, the proximeter gets calibrated for a known input impedance based on cable length. If you give it too much cable, the impedance will be too high. So the proximeter says one, five, or nine meter system somewhere on the label. This old silver one has it etched into the label, and then these blue ones that Bentley Nevada makes, you can kind of see a nine here. It's hard to see it. Uh, it's on the label on the top. So on the label, it'll tell you the uh, cable length used with that system. The installer's job is to make sure that the cable length is correct and then to gap the probe correctly. And if you do those two things, you'll have something that is extremely accurate where uh, DC voltage can actually be used for position and AC voltage is used for vibration. It's, it's really amazing how it keeps up with the speed of the machine and depending upon whether you're looking at the DC or AC component of the signal, you can actually measure two different things. The system doesn't care. It's, it's going to spit out a voltage that is extremely accurate and um, an indicator of how far the shaft is away from the face of the probe. And it doesn't matter if the shaft tating or not, uh, it can be used for position. You know, the thrust probes measure position and uh, differential expansion probes measure position, or it can be used by using the DC voltage, or it can be used for vibration by using the, the AC voltage. Uh, quick aside here for if you have a Bentley Nevada system, how to uh, know the cable lengths without actually measuring them. Um, I think they could make this easier, but, but um, that's just my opinion. So on the label, the proximeter will tell you what type of cable length you should use with that system. It's the number after the third dash. So one, two, three dashes, you see a 10. That means it is a one meter integral cable on the probe. And on the extension cable, which is pictured over here, it's the number after the first dash. So it's actually not consistent between the dashes. Um, the number after the first dash equals the cable length. So in this case, this was a four meter cable. Why is cap voltage important? Another football reference. Great for one outside the United States that doesn't care about American football. Just picture soccer. It's fine. Or just keep calling it football. It's fine. Another American football reference here. Sorry. So um, why is gap voltage important? Well, uh, let me give you an example from the sports world. So when my, my grandfather taught me how to golf and the man, it was annoying. He, he'd hit it 150 yards dead straight every time. I could hit it really far, but I had no idea where it was going. He would hit it 150 yards straight and he'd either get a par or a bogey every time. It just came down to whether or not he's going to make the putt. Anyway, I could only see about 50 yards. We would play this par three when I was a kid and some of the holes were 60 yards. He couldn't see the green. I had to point him toward it and he would just hit the ball and go dead straight right on the green every time. And then he'd ask me if it went on the green or not. I said, yeah, of course it went on the green. Anyway, he could only see 50 yards. So he didn't, wasn't a big football fan, but hypothetically, if I took him to a Buffalo Bills game and I, I stuck him on the, I brought him to the game the only way he could really watch the game is if he was positioned right where the coach stands on the 50-yard line. He'd have to be right about here. And then since he can see 50 yards, he can see the ball cross the end zone over here, and he could see the ball cross the end zone over here, and he'd be good to go. And that's kind of like how a proximity probe works. By the way, this was my actual beat for uh, Bill's games for like seven years. So that was... That was always fun. We weren't very good at football. Um, I was actually in the Associated Press, so I wasn't exactly cheering, although I wanted to, like deep down. But uh, I got to sit right on the 50-yard line, which is pretty neat. Anyway, back to proximity probes. Uh, the proximity probe, like I said, is, uh, is linear from 10 to 90 mils, and they usually calibrate this extra point uh, over here at 100 mils and, and give it to you on the CalCert also. So the key is when we install the probe, we want the gap voltage to be negative nine or negative 10, somewhere in that range. Everyone's procedures are different. A lot of people use negative 10. Uh, some people use negative nine. 
I use negative nine in this presentation, but you don't have to. So at negative nine, that means the probe is 50 mils from the turbine shaft, turbine shaft before we start. And then once we start, we know that that turbine shaft can move 40 mils this way and 40 mils this way, and we can still measure it. Now, if the vibration is moving 40 mils and you have a significant problem. So um, with gap voltage, as long as you're close to the middle here, you should be fine. But um, that's why gap voltage is important. It ensures that the probe is in the center of its linear range before the machinery starts rotating. Now, correct gap voltage does not ensure correct output, which is uh, kind of interesting. Moving on. We, um, uh, so just taking another look at our proximity probe calip comparison test using a shaker table, this is what the technicians would have seen. At uh, the alert test point, they saw 160 microns on the screen at 3,600 cycles per minute. And at the alarm set point, it was 250 microns at uh, 3,600 cycles per minute. So what if the numbers are not close? Well, it could be a cable length issue. A typical probe is 200 millivolts per mil or 7.87 millivolts per micron. 11 millimeter probes have half the output and double the range. What happens if we connect a cable that is too long? So in this case, our proximeter was asking for five meters of cable and we connected 5.5 meters of cable. What happened was this longer cable caused our gap voltage to decrease to negative 7.69. It was negative nine. It dropped to negative 7.69 when we connected the cable that was too long for the system. I didn't fix that just yet. Our probe is still gapped correctly. We're just getting the wrong reading here because we have the wrong impedance. And in this situation, we created an 11.5% low output where we were only getting 177 millivolts per mil or roughly seven millivolts per micron when we're expecting 207.87 respectively. Now, um, if you install the probe with the wrong cable and you do not check the system prior, uh, either by shaker or wobulator or static probe curve, all three of those, whether you use our system or not, static probe curve, you'll find it. You'll find a cable error doing a static probe curve. Wobulator, you'll find it if you use it correctly. And shaker table, of course, you're, you're also going to find um, a uh, cable error with the proximity probe. But if you don't check the system prior to, do, uh, to installation, you will have the wrong output if you install the probe in the turbine and then fire it up. Uh, the output with the wrong cable, the output's not going to be correct. Even though the probe might be in the right position, like physically gapped properly, you still, you, you'll have the wrong gap voltage. The problem with using gap voltage to figure out if the probe is installed correctly is um, it's easy to correct it. Uh, just a quarter turn of the probe will fix the gap voltage even if you have the wrong cable connected. And that's a minuscule distance, hard to see with the naked eye, first of all. So the natural tendency is to say, oh, this probe must be too close or too far from the machine. So let me just turn it a quarter and I'll be able to hit my gap voltage right on the nose, just like the procedure says, and we'll be good to go. But that's not always the case. You can install the wrong cable and have the right gap voltage just by turning the probe, uh, you know, by, by a quarter turn. And here's an example of that. So in this case, I continued with my error where I, I left my extra length of cable connected to the system. So I'm sending the proximeter extra impedance. I'm sending it 5.5 meters of cable and the proximeter is specified for five meters of cable. So the longer cable caused the gap voltage to decrease like I showed in the previous slide. So now I've adjusted the gap voltage to negative nine volts DC by just twisting the micrometer just a little bit. And I have made my error worse than it was before. I was getting a 11% error, 11.5% error before. Now I'm getting 16% error. Now my output is closer to 169 millivolts per mil 
at three mils and 3,000 cycles per minute and closer to 6.65 millivolts per micron when I'm expecting the values you see here of 200 and 7.87 respectively. So having the correct gap voltage is not a foolproof way of making sure that the probe is installed correctly. And again, this is this is mostly the Bentley Nevada system. There's some other systems out there that can be uh, recalibrated um, even if you have the uh, wrong cable connected or different cable connected or you can specify how much cable you want connected. But um, most of our customers use a Bentley system, so we tend to train on that uh, that particular topic. But there are uh, there are other systems out there that uh, how do I put it? are also forgiving and, and good systems. Um, so, you know, um, okay. <laughs> uh, shows how old I am. Whenever I am working with a plant and I do this globally, we go on site and we conduct uh, vibration shaker table training. Um, you know, we're not going on site right now but uh, we are doing trainings through WebEx and uh, it's usually anywhere from 90 minutes to two hours and it's a hands-on training. Um, anyway, when we go on site and we um, do a training uh, for anyone that installs their own proximity probes and they have a massive supply cabinet full of extension cables of every size and series. They got five, eight, 11 millimeter. They've, they've got all kinds of uh, cable lengths. Um, I can kind of tell that, you know, there, there's going to be this moment uh, in the training where the room's going to get uh, really quiet. After I go through um, the slides that I just went through showing the uh, gap voltage and how an excess cable length affects the gap voltage and how you can correct for that gap voltage simply by changing the position of the probe and still have an incorrect dynamic output, the room tends to get pretty quiet. Um, it happens. It happens to everyone. I went to uh, training. Um, it was a conference in Houston where it, it happened to one of the, the high ranking um, officials from a major um, petrochemical company. Shouldn't say who it is. Um, so it happens to everyone. Uh, fact is, a 16% error will result in uh, an actual vibration of six. And, uh, I'm sorry, with eight mils of actual vibration, you'll only be reading 6.72 mils if you're 16% low and uh, in microns, 200 microns will equate to 168 microns. So a significantly greater amount of vibration is required before you reach the uh, alarm alert or alarm uh, trip level in the monitoring system. The good news is this error can be corrected simply by uh, replacing the extension cable in most cases and uh, can be prevented in the future by paying close attention to uh, cable lengths, cable series, and of course setting the proper gap voltage. Changing topics. That was proximity probes in a nutshell. Semi-complicated topic, but uh, again, really good measurement system. Um, high level of accuracy. It's amazing what you can do with a proximity probe. So just have to pay attention to making sure it gets installed correctly and gapped correctly. Uh, changing topics to um, gas turbine or turbine accelerometers, high temp turbine vibration sensors, charge amps, and uh, cabling, which you see on the screen here. Um, these are really expensive. Um, so the question is, uh, if, you, if they're wrong, if anything is wrong in the system, do you have to replace the whole system? Well, no, you can, you can get down and you can isolate which component is giving you trouble using a uh, portable shaker table. So let's take a look at how you might uh, do that. Here, uh, how do you test a system with a shaker? Well, uh, every turbine accelerometer is uh, connected to a charge amplifier. And the first thing I do, it, well, first thing I do is I do a loop check. And if that, the loop check being a known vibration on the screen versus, I'm like pointing right at the camera. I don't know why I did that. Known vibration on the screen versus measured vibration in the control room. That's the first step. Now, if that incorrect or significantly off, then you can break it down at the component level. And the first thing I'm going to do is test the charge amplifier and the charge accelerometer 
connected as a system. And I do that uh, to the easiest way to sort of isolate the problem. If that works correctly, then you know the problem somewhere else. You know the problem might be in scaling or it might be in the cabling that connects the output of the charge amplifier to the monitoring system. It's probably a scaling issue. Um, if the output of the charge sensor and charge amplifier together are not correct, then you know that something either hap something happened to one of those two components, which we can cover on the next slide. So that's why I like to do that first. Um, if I'm using a voltmeter, the output of a charge amp can be an AC voltage or AC current. Uh, you got to pay attention to that. And um, if I'm using a, a DVM to measure one of those two values, I like to shake the accelerometer in the RMS scale. So every shaker, like I said, has, well, not every shaker, but our shakers have uh, peak and RMS scales for Gs and inches per second or um, the metric versions, so meters per second squared and millimeters per second, you can shake in both peak and RMS, which I'm actually going to cover the difference a little bit later. But shake in RMS because a voltmeter reads in volts or current RMS. So that way you don't have to do any math. If you're expecting, uh, you're going to be expecting a known voltage out of your charge amplifier. Um, so by shaking at one inch per second or RMS or 10 millimeters per second RMS, it actually makes the math really easy because uh, you're with one inch per second RMS, you're dividing by one. So if, if I'm expecting uh, just to use an arbitrary value, 77 millivolts per inch per second out of my charge amplifier, um, if I shake it one inch per second, I just look for 77 millivolts on the DVM. Uh, of course, you don't have to um, use a DVM if you have a shaker with a sensitivity display and a, and a calculation on the screen, but you don't have to have that. You can just use a DVM to test these, uh, these components. How do I isolate the accelerometer? Well, the output is in picocoulombs, so it won't just connect straight to a DVM. Picocoulombs are a measure of electric charge, and um, you need to convert it to a voltage first before you can actually, or a current before you can actually measure. I mean, I'm sure there's systems out there that can measure it, but not that easily. Um, so you have to convert to voltage or current first. Um, if you want to isolate the uh, vibration sensor itself, you can use a known good charge amplifier, you know, one that's been calibrated and it doesn't have to cost you an arm and a leg, but like a spare one that you keep in the INC shop to convert the signal from units of raw charge to uh, voltage and then uh, make sure that's calibrated if, if, if your company specifies on an annual basis and then you can connect the output of that known good charge amplifier and figure out if the set to a to a DVM and figure out if that's uh, transducer is uh, out of tolerance or you can use a shaker table with a sensitivity display built in and and with a calibrated charge amplifier on the inside and then it'll just tell you what the voltage is in uh, picocoulombs per g. So that's one way to isolate charge amplifier. Be sure that um, if you're going to use a shaker table, um, be sure that the charge input on it is calibrated as well as the actual shaker motion. So um, using a shaker table, you can uh, really get down to the, the charge mode accelerometer. You can get down to the uh, raw components of a charge mode system on a gas turbine and figure out what part of the system is faulty and then just replace that one part of the system and keep the rest intact. Speaking of peak versus RMS, excuse me, uh, whenever, you know what, whenever someone, I need to pick up the pace a little bit here to hit my 45 minutes, but whenever someone says um, uh, they're off by 1.414, or point, I, I see it like immediately. If someone's measuring, uh, let's say someone's measuring in RMS, but they're shaking in peak, they're going to be 0.707 too low. So if they're, they want one inch per second and they're seeing 0.707, I know it's a peak versus RMS issue. What is peak versus RMS and why is it important for four to 20 milliamp vibration transmitters? Well. 4 to 20 milliamp vibration transmitters take the motion 
here, this sine wave is just happening really fast in actual vibration motion. They take that shaking that's occurring and they draw a line and give you a DC current output based on the position of that line. You can draw it in two spots. You can draw the line at the peak. So some of these transmitters are scaled for peak where the, the RMS to DC conversion occurs at the very top of the sine wave. And so they draw the line there where you see it, and my, my uh, fun laser pointer, or they draw it at the RMS point, which is 0 0.707 of the peak, slightly below the peak right here. So it's all a matter of where the sensor is going to draw that line in relation to the sine wave. And the key for uh, testing these particular transducers is to take a look at the specification sheet and pay attention to whether or not they're scaled in inches per second peak or millimeters per second peak versus those same scales in RMS. And then just shake in the corresponding scale and you won't have a peak versus RMS uh, error. Now, how do these transducers fail? Well, they tend to drift low over time. So this was a 4 to 20 milliamp vibration transmitter uh, that was about 10 years old, and you can see it didn't really come close to reaching full scale. Full scale was 1 inch per second peak. Uh, we're supposed to get 20 milliamps at 1 inch per second peak, and we were only getting 18.74. So this was significantly low. Now, unfortunately, 4 to 20 milliamp vibration transmitters cannot be trimmed. Everything, not everything, but most everything in 4 to 20 land can be trimmed. You can take a pressure sensor and trim it and bring it back within tolerance. Same with temperature, same with flow. Um, you can trim this instrumentation and communicate with it to make the output correct again. Uh, with 4 to 20 milliamp vibration transmitters, um, there are no technologies on the market that allow you to trim it. So we had to uh, replace this transducer. You can also calibrate and test 4 to 20 milliamp vibration transmitters with a process instrumentation calibrator, which is kind of cool because it'll supply power to the sensor and it works just like anything else that you have that's 4 to 20 milliamp. It's just vibration. So picture a lot of people use a hand pump to test pressure sensors with a process instrumentation calibrator. In this case, your hand pump is your shaker and it, it takes the place of the pressure hand pump and everything else is the same so you can do a linearity test and you can do a percent of span output error calculation we happen to use a, a bmex process instrumentation calibrator in this case but um, uh, there's a lot of products on the market that can work for that and create reports in case you uh, are audited for um, uh, the calibration of your vibration instrumentation Finally, uh, mechanical vibration switches, one of the last slides here, running a little bit over time. I didn't realize how long this would take. Too many jokes from my side. Uh, mechanical vibration switches are way more popular than electronic. So there's two types of vibration switches, mechanical and electronic. Mechanical's cheap. Mechanical gets installed by OEMs because they're cheap and, and um, they fill the requirement for vibration monitoring on cooling towers and things like that. So the problem with mechanical is they are all too heavy for portable shakers. Uh, hasn't been a shaker made yet that could drive these types of uh, mechanical vibration switches. More power is uh, needed in the shaker. A more powerful shaker is needed to really drive those and test them. Electronic vibration switches are pretty cool. Um, PCB offers uh, the only ones that are light enough to be uh, tested with a portable shaker table, which I'll uh, show you right here on this slide. Let's just hit this video. This is a video, right? This is a video. Apparently not. Oh, no, I have to turn off the laser pointer. Sorry about that. Whoops. All right, now I can play the video. There we go. So uh, let's set this up. So we're going to keep our eye right over here. These are where the alerts and alarms are. This light and this light. This light's already lit up because it's the alert. And then this is the alarm. And it occurs at one inch per second. This whole assembly weighs 750 grams. And we have our alerts and alarms non-latching with no time delay. So as I drop the shaker table 
under and over the one inch per second threshold, you see this light turn on and off. And we'll go back up over one and then boom, the moment we cross one, the light turns on. The moment we go under one because it's non latching, the light turns off. So these vibration switches can be calibrated. They can even be set using a shaker table uh, where you actually turn these potentiometers and there goes the alert light, but turn these potentiometers to precision set them based on the known vibration that's being produced by the uh, shaker table itself. So it's a pretty cool design for an electronic vibration switch, but unfortunately most uh, electronic vibration switches are also too heavy for a uh, shaker table, uh, which is very unfortunate. Um, if a vibration sensor is out of tolerance, can you fix it? No, usually not. Usually it has to be replaced. But you can make changes in data acquisition, which is kind of what I'm showing here with an old CSI 2130. So like this is, okay, this is kind of a slippery slope because if you have a lot of transducers and you don't know which one you're gonna use all the time with this 2130, I wouldn't recommend changing the sensitivity. I would rather take the error because next thing you know, you change it to 90 millivolts per G and then someone grabs a 110 millivolt per G sensor and you're way off. So um, unless you can ensure that you're gonna use the same accelerometer all the time with your 2130 or 2140, I wouldn't make an adjustment. Same, I would rather throw the sensor away, buy a new one that is, you know, you can specify ones that are plus or minus 5% and get something that's fairly tight. Uh, you can even specify quartz, which is extremely stable over time. Um, little plug there. Um, same with the proximity probe monitoring system. People ask me like, oh, I installed, they'll say I installed the wrong cable. Should I just change sensitivity? Well, the next thing you know, the next time the, the turbine's down, someone changes the installation and they forget that you changed something in software and um, all of a sudden you're, you're way, way off. You're way too high. You're getting false trips. So unless you are Unless you can document it and you're absolutely sure, I'm not a huge fan of changing software to compensate for error in the uh, vibration sensors. Um, I think replacing them is, is probably the better path, but that is, uh, well, that's, that's my two cents on the issue. <laughs> uh... Final thoughts on uh, the common reasons for error. And maybe by the end of this presentation, you've gotten to the point where you're ready to tear up your vibration data, your procedures, or even your employment contract as I might be. Remember that uh, here are some of the most common vibration faults. It's not too bad. Uh, most common thing I see is a scaling, you know, peak RMS type of issue or what's programmed as full scale 20 milliamps is incorrect or the input sensitivity is incorrect. So, uh, or the wrong channels wired to the wrong input. I get customer stories about that all the time. So a lot of it uh, can be shot within the uh, monitoring system itself. Um, Spiking is another big issue, which leads to false trips. Um, I get stories all the time about grounding issues. I had a customer tell me that they used they, they used a shaker table and all of their prox probes worked fine. And then the moment they start up the equipment, they spike. Well, they worked with the OEM on it. It turned out it was a grounding issue. They were using the wrong screws in the back of the cabinet that held all of the proximeters. So you have to pay a lot of attention to ground loops and grounding. Yeah, so that, that's an important element. Um, of the installation. Um, the spiking, by the way, can be alleviated with time delay. Like I showed the vibration switch and um, I was crossing the threshold of one inch per second and then going back and it was non-latching and it had no time delay. So you can see how that would trip and then not trip and then trip and then not trip. But if you have a time delay, like I had with the vibe alarm display earlier in the presentation, you actually have to experience three, five, 10, could be 20, could be 40, whatever you program. That, you have to experience real vibration for that amount of time, say it's three seconds. Real vibration for three seconds before you shut anything down. And that helps to alleviate spiking, helps to uh, a fall strip due to spiking, not alleviate the spiking itself. And it helps to um, ensure against, uh, you'll keep running uh, despite a transient vibration event. That's not like real vibration, okay? 
trying to go a little quicker here. Um, yeah, we have portable shaker tables. You can also rent them. Uh, we talked about it a lot here. So uh, I'm going to just kind of blow right through there. And now nah, this is like my sales side on the shaker table. I'm going to blow right through the sales slide. Uh, last week we did uh, high temp turbine, turbine vibration sensors. Um, which actually was a bit more salesy than this pr presentation, but it had a lot of good technical information. So I just wanted to call attention to that. If you'd like a copy of the uh, video version of that presentation, please tell us. These are some of the reasons why. Um, we didn't talk much about price delivery. Uh, we kept it very technical. So uh, we talked about calibration. You know, uh, the sensors that are used by OEMs on gas turbines are not full frequency sweep calibrated quite often. So that's an advantage to switching to PCB. Uh, we do have elements that are less susceptible to spiking and hazardous area approvals. Next webinar is going to be November 19th, noise exposure. We are going to talk about all the cool advancements in noise dosimetry. The technology uh, seems to have been stuck in the 90s for a long time and we are bringing it into the 21st century wireless connections that download data as soon as you get into your office you know bluetooth phone apps intuitive software and uh, the noise dosimetry from our larson davis division did win the 2019 osha new product of the year i think i'm i think i'm uh, remembering that correctly um, but it is being brought into the 21st century, so, so there's some really cool stuff that uh, we can do now with uh, noise exposure. You can actually see it on your phone. You can look at your whole staff on your phone, and you can be standing there in the plant and see that uh, a colleague of yours is experiencing a higher than desired noise dose. So why is it happening? Well, you know, he's standing really close to the piece of machinery or that, you know, whatever it is. So uh, fun stuff next week with uh, noise dosimetry. That is the end of the presentation. I apologize for uh, for how long it went. I uh, had more to share than I thought originally. All right. Well, again, I just want to thank everyone for taking the time today. I hope you found the webinar informative, and I hope that you join us next week for noise dosimetry. Thanks. Take care.